can we really get creative? And I started thinking last month and you know, I've got these friends, I've got a lot of them in the real estate investing world, because just a little bit of history for you, we would provide credit card processing to a lot of the big greats that you know, that you've heard of, like the Robert Allens, you know, you've probably heard of Robert Allen, no money down, right? There's the Russ Whitney's, right? We've heard of Russ Whitney. In fact, we had him on the happy hour. And there's a lot of Jerry Foster, who's a real estate investor who's on here as well and real estate investor educators. And I was just always so amazed by the good work that I was able to witness when I shared the stage with these men and women as well. And I was just always like, I look at them as, you know, the ones that guided me down that speaker's path. Because I watched them on stage teach, motivate, inspire, yeah, I mean, look, that's why I do what I do today, because I watched how much of an impact they had on folks' lives. You know, maybe it was 500 people in the audience, maybe it was 1,000 people in the audience, but I really learned from a lot of these speakers on what they were teaching. Now, real estate investing is not what we're going to talk about tonight, but it got to thinking about it, and I go, I know all these great speaker thought leaders in the real estate investing space but guess what? They teach how to motivate. They teach how to inspire. They teach how to go find clients. They teach how to close. And so I believe the content transfers. And so I'm going to start reaching out to my real estate investing guru buddies, and I'm going to get them to share knowledge, not about flipping a home or buying a house with no money down. If you want that, you can follow them, but it's going to be about the things that they learned over their career that has helped prop up their students over the years in a coaching and mentoring capacity. So none other, I am joined by none other than Mr. Bill Barnett, someone who now I've known for over two decades as well. We shared the same, same stage together. Robert Allen, for instance, you know, and Bill Barnett, is one of my absolute favorite. He's from Texas. He's from Texas. So, you know, you don't want to mess with Texas. But Bill Barnett, you know, he really understands selling and he understands what, what you're going to learn today. You're going to be able to apply it in your agencies. Now, I've already told Bill. I said, look, here's the thing. My audience, they have to get up. They got to get out there and they got to get after the business because you know, we're, it's, the business is not just going to come knock on your doorstep and find its way into your bank account. And so we have the same, same issues with regards to taking action within our student base. Our student base needs to be motivated, galvanized to get out there and serve. Now, what they're doing is they're calling on local businesses. They're calling on local businesses selling mobile apps for three to $5,000 or they're selling marketing services. Bill, you and I have been talking about marketing services lately. You're, you're basically immersed in a group of folks that sell marketing services anywhere from $1,000 to $3,000 a month retainers, Google AdWords, Facebook ads, reputation marketing, you name it. They've been here in the GoMobile community. And so that's the audience. I'm excited to see how you light them up with the stuff that you've been teaching folks over the years. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, first of all, for being willing to do this. Thank you for doing it on a Friday night, you know. So say hi to the GoMobile community, Bill. We're going to have some fun tonight, Big D, and, and uh, just talking about some things, you know, I've, I've had the incredible privilege uh, throughout my life to be mentored by some amazing people. I still, uh, not only do I do mentoring, I've been doing that for 20 plus years myself, teaching mentoring, but I still take mentoring. I still, I've got two mentors uh, that I pay. Um, I think there are still, I, a lot of people think it's a lot of money. I think there are still uh, for what I get them for, but I keep mentors. Uh, in my pocket all the time because there's always somebody at a different level and everything that we do, there's always somebody if we're here. There's always somebody here. Then there's somebody above that. And I'm always looking for what's the areas that I can improve in. And in doing that, I'm always looking for who's the top people in that area and do they offer coaching and mentoring and how do I get involved with them? And I've, I've had some through the years that, that didn't offer it as a product or a service, but you'd be amazed how many times when you go to somebody that you have respect for and you know what they do 
and you sit down and talk to them and say, hey, you know what? I'd like to have an opportunity to learn from you how many times they'll take time out of their schedule, no matter how busy they might be, to say, you know what? Here's how I did this thing. And in fact, Damon, we're starting a, uh, a new podcast here in about three weeks that uh, is titled, How'd You Get Started Doing That? And it's with business leaders that I've met all through the years, uh, all about uh, that one question. How'd you get started doing that? Because everybody has a unique story about how they got started in their business. And so that you'll see, we'll get you some information on that. And uh, so we'll uh, have that going forward. But tonight we're going to be talking about some uh, real key components to what makes a business go and what makes a business successful. So I'm going to jump on the uh, share on screen here. Light up the chat room. Say welcome, Bill. And who's on board for that? I like it to be interactive, Bill. You might even get interrupted a couple times tonight. I hope so, guys. Here's the deal. And we'll uh, let me pull my slides up, and then we'll uh, I'll uh, pop something up here real quick. All right. So uh, a little good housekeeping. Uh, we all seen the good housekeeping seal of approval and. Uh, Damien, I can assure you this has got the good housekeeping seal of approval on it, brother. But it's this. There's going to be questions tonight, and don't hesitate. You've got a question. Uh, questions, I love questions. That means you're involved. That means that you're getting it, you're thinking about it. Uh, and when those things pop up, Damien, I'm going to let you handle um, monitoring the questions. Okay. And then you just interrupt me uh, when a question comes through. So hop in the chat and pop a question down, and then uh, Damien will – um, tell me, whoa, cowboy, it's time for us to answer a question or two here. So don't hesitate to do that because we're going to talk about some things that uh, you may want to know how I implement those very deeply into my business because these are core principles. They don't have anything to do with real estate. They have everything to do with real estate. They don't have anything to do with Go Mobile. They have everything to do with Go Mobile because they are core strengths on how you build a business and how we build that relationship. You know, we're all uh, adults on here, and, and what you find out as you get a little maturity in life is that when we get, when we're young, we think about business, and we think about business as being, oh, I'm in the house business, I'm in the car business, I'm in this business, I'm in that business. As you get a little bit older, you start to understand, and as you get a little bit more successful, no, those are your commodities. Those are my commodities. Those are Jerry's commodities. Those are Jamie's commodities. We're all in the people business. And understanding people is what the core of business success is all about. It's all about the relationships. And so when people have to, one of uh, Jim Eaton is a guy who's a, a sales trainer of mine uh, back in the 70s, got drilled down. It's the first time I heard anybody say it. I'm sure it's been said thousands of times. But Jim taught me, he's like, Bill, they got to know you. They got to like you. They got to trust you. That's all relationships. And that's the, what we're going to be talking about tonight, things that build us stronger relationships with our clients, because the stronger relationship that we have, they're going to turn to you first, and they're not going to turn away from you. I, I had an, an example this uh, past week where uh, a guy I do a lot of business with, i would had uh, an issue with uh, one of my teeth. I broke a tooth this past week, and, uh, you know, that's a royal pain never happens at a convenient time and happened at night. And one of the guys with a client and he goes, wow, man, you know, do we need to leave? And I'm, I'm like, no, we're not going to leave. Guys, uh, just not going to worry about that. He said, well, you want to call your dentist tomorrow? You know, don't forget to do that. And I'm like, I'm not calling my dentist tomorrow. I'm going to call him right now because it's eight 30. And I'm like, well, yeah, but this is a guy I've been doing business with for 30 years I have his home number. I'm going to call his cell. And unless he's out on a date with his wife, he's probably going to answer it. And so I call him and he's like, hey, if you're hurting, I can go meet you at the office now. It took me about 45 minutes to get there. I said, no, 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 I'm not hurting. He goes, fine. Come in before we open in the morning because I'm booked solid, but come in at 730 and I'll take care of it. That's relationship. And I told the, the guy, the client that had been with, I called him later on that day. And I said, this is why I go to that guy. Because the guy's not convenient at all. He's about 40 miles from where I live. I said, this is why I go to him. Because it's relationship. 
and he understands customer service, understands relationship, and I want to have my clients having that same experience with me, knowing that they can count on me. And that's what you want, knowing that they can count on you and build that relationship. So tonight we're going to talk about what I refer to as the power of selection, because the power of selection gets it to where we are focused on who our clients truly are and what they are searching for out of us. So you've been selected. Uh, a lot of us, we're probably all seen this at some point in our life, the selective service system, got a draft notice. Well, you've been selected. There's something that you do with your business that you've been selected to uniquely fill that position and to service those customers. And so when we start building clients, the key thing that I always talk to when I bring somebody on and start mentoring them is, who is it that you serve? And of course, I'm in real estate, so they go, oh, I, well, I service buyers. And I'm like, really? Is that who you service? Because if it's that broad, that's, that's going to be a problem for you. We need to drill down on that. We're going to talk about drilling down later on and, and how that fits into what uh, we all do. So we've all been called to serve a certain segment of the marketplace. What I've been called to serve in the real estate side is guaranteed income and people that are less fortunate than all of us on this call and they need some help with housing. That's the segment of the marketplace that I serve, but you got to get down to that focus so that you understand who these people are that you serve. Because until you understand who they are and not just who they are from a business standpoint, but who they are, if you don't know a little bit about them, and I'm not just talking about, oh, I know when their kids' birthdays are, that kind of stuff. If you don't have some idea of the things that are going on in their head on a regular basis, some about their business, some about their family, some about their circumstances, if you don't understand what's going on, I refer to it as the conversation in their head. If you don't get involved in that conversation and understand what's happening with that conversation, you're never going to have a real connection uh, with your clients as you move forward. And somewhere down the road, that's going to cost you business because they're either going to turn somewhere else uh, and they're, sometimes they won't even know why, but it's because they didn't have that connection. So we've all been selected to serve somebody. Now, who have you been selected by? Now, for me, um, I'm a Christian. I've been selected by God to serve the people that I do. Uh, if that identifies for you, terrific. It may be that you think the universe has uh, called you to serve your client base. That's fine. Got no issues with that. Maybe you just think it's fate that you're in the position that you're in. But we've all been selected to be where we are right now, servicing the people that we do business with on a daily basis. And so when we realize that this is what I was put here to do, because I, I have a, a really good friend who's a former pastor of mine from years gone back. And um, he said, hey, you know, Bill, look, everybody's not called to be a pastor, but everybody's called to have a ministry. Not everybody's going to be that minister, but everybody's going to be a ministry. That's a business statement if I ever heard one. Yeah. Because all of us, we may not be the leader of our company, but we're all called to service our client base. We may be on the first rung of interaction with those clients. We may be the CEO, but we're all out there building this company to service those clients. And how we do that is by understanding that we're here to serve. That's what our life is all about, is giving service to others. That's what we get paid to do. And the more service that we can give our client base, the more reward that we get. And a lot of times we miss out on that. We want to get the reward first. We want to get paid first. That's all we're focused on, especially when we're younger. And then we start to understand there's a way to increase my value. We're going to talk about value later on. There's a way to increase my value to my client base. If I can increase my value to my client base, my client base is more committed to me and they understand that I'm going to be there for them. And understanding who this is that I serve is a huge, huge piece of moving forward in the business. you got to have a passion for the people that you work with. 
And whether it's, uh, I call it our fellow Americans, or whether you're just thinking human beings in general, then this is the experience for you. We have the greatest opportunities in front of us getting to deal with people at times when there are crises going on. That right now, there's our country's in a total disaster and it's a mess, not getting any better. We're about to have inflation like we've never seen, unless you're my age and then you live through the Carter years and you've seen that. We're about to have inflation like crazy. I paid $3.09, which in Texas is a, a, actually considered a sin. Uh, for gas yesterday, for regular unleaded. I'm like, man, here we go again. So we're going to be seeing all that stuff. There's going to be a lot of chaos. There's going to be a lot of turmoil going on. And as that happens, our clients need us more and more. They need to know that we're a steadying hand for them so that when they get freaked out on how all this stuff is going to impact their business, because it's going to hit every one of us in some form or another. And as it does, if they know that we're there for them to help steady their business, and we may not be able to do anything other than talk to them. It builds that relationship stronger and stronger and stronger. And they know, wow, this guy's on my team. This gal's on my team. And they look forward to us having conversation with them, for us calling on them. When we get something new, it's not like, wow, he just wants to sell me something else. They get excited to be able to hear the things that we have to say to them when they know what our relationship is. And, and I learned this from Zig Ziglar. I, I actually think it was uh, Calvin Coolidge that uh, said it originally, but is the statement of they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And there's just not anything truer in business than that. So if they understand that you really do, you like them, whether Look, there's something that you can like about everybody. And if you find that you've got a client that there's nothing that you can like about them, you need to hand them off to somebody else then because they need to be able to know that they've got a partner in business with you and with me. So if you've got a passion for this, this is the way I look at it. It's not my work. It's my passion. I've been asked for years. I'm uh, a few years older than Damien, wink, wink, nod, nod. Uh, and I've been asked for years, well, you know, when are you going to retire? And I'm like, I, you know, when they put me in the hole, uh, I'm going to retire. And if I have my way, I'm going to own that piece of real estate too. That's it. You know, I, I don't have any intentions of ever stopping doing what I do because it is passion. It's not work. It is my calling. It's not my job. And when you find what it is with Go Mobile that fits for you, that becomes a calling, it changes your performance because you want to do better all the time for your clients because you get eat up with it. And, and I've been eat up with real estate for 30 something years now. And now it, it's just one of those things that when you understand how to unlock the passion then motivation goes out the window. You never have to be uh, concerned about being motivated again once you understand passion. So here's the thing for everybody that's with us till the end tonight, and uh, I love the name of this uh, Friday Happy Hour because, Damien, until you call, that's right where I would be right now. I've already had two guys uh, buzz out of our little group uh, this afternoon going, hey, where are we going? I'm like, well, um, I've got something else I need to be doing tonight. <laughs> <We're going> so, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I love the happy hour day because it's a, it's just a great time to get together with friends. So for everybody that stays until the end, I'd like to give you a copy of my national best-selling book. It's a PDF on it. And look, you may not have any interest in real estate at all, but I can promise you if you'll take the time to read it, it's not going to make you interested in real estate, but if you'll take the time to read it, what it is going to do is it's going to show you some great sales examples and how to be able to take those lessons and transfer them over to your business. So uh, are you dumb enough to be rich? This, uh, rich? this was the second edition. The first edition and the second were both national bestsellers, both on Wall Street Journal and in Amazon. So for everybody that hangs around tonight uh, through the end of the presentation, it'd be my honor to send you a PDF copy of that. And uh, maybe another little surprise hooked on there too, if that's all right with you, Big D. Does that work for you, Damien? Yeah, let's rock and roll. 
All right, man. Really cool, nice man. Of you, man, to be able to give him the book. We, we mentioned the book in the emails that I sent out. Didn't realize we were going to cool. give it to him. That's awesome. Cool, cool, cool. cool. So there's a lot of things that I've done right over the last 30 plus, 40 plus years uh, of my professional life. Um, 30 years of it in real estate. I had 10 years in the uh, investment banking and financial services world. Uh, and I spent a little time in truck lines before that. But so I really look at that 40 years, the, the 30 in real estate and the 10 years of investment banking, really look at that as my professional life and a lot of things that that happened right during those times and a great part of it was because of this motto and once i heard this motto it hit me to my core and i've tried to live by it every day and it may be a little surprising for you uh, what it is but it's this whoops it is say yes to the opportunity and clean the mess up later Say yes to the opportunity, clean the mess up later. And what happens when you open yourself there up to the opportunity? Now I know the secret to my damn success right there. <laughs> That's it. This whole time I've been wondering what the hell it was. It was that. <laughs> what happens when you do that and you don't step back and try to figure out all the parameters? Well, what's going to happen if I do this or that? Is you're going to avail yourself to a lot more opportunities than you have in the past. And then that clean the mess up later, you figure it out. It just happens. Uh, a, a great example is the book. So I, I got uh, a call from Amacom, who was uh, my original publisher. And they said, hey, we're looking for a real estate author. Your name keeps coming up. And so we want to talk to you about writing a book. And I had a conversation and I'm like, I said, yep, let's do it. And so I went down, I was married at the time, went down and told my wife, I said, hey, uh, you know, I've just uh, agreed to write a book. I've got a publisher sending me a contract. You know, I was feeling pretty cocky. And she's like, write a book? You, what are you going to write a book about? I'm like, what do you mean? I'm going to write a book about real estate. She said, well, can you write? I'm like, well, yeah. So, well, how do you know you can write? Well, because I can talk. If I can talk and put it on paper, it's about the same thing. Well, I didn't take the time to try to think out all of that stuff before I said yes. I said yes, and then I had a timeline from the publisher that I had to have the first full draft in by. And so now I've got something I can go work at. And Robert Allen was a huge, huge help uh, for me in the book and actually wrote the forward to it. Uh, but... One of the other things that happened. By the way, that is a great, great message and a great tool that you just gave everybody because, you know, it will sort itself out. And and I know I was kind of joking there when I said that this is how I did everything. But, you know, I, a lot of what I've done over 30 years was just saying yes, having faith that it's going to sort itself out. My team's going to sort it out. I know Derek's laughing right now. How many times have I done that to him? And the app team, et cetera. So this is a really good tool. And really what it does for all of you on here, you know, it, it assists in the lane of taking massive action. At the end of the day, it's yet another tool. You can just be okay with cleaning it up later. Just yeah. take action now. Good stuff, man. And that take action now thing, uh, you know, Tony Robbins is one of my favorites. And, and one of Tony's basic quotes is, hey, massive action now. And there's, there's so much truth to that. So uh, I'm dad, I'll give you a little bit uh, about me here. Dad to these uh, three amazing young men here. The one on the far left, that's uh, Trey. Uh, he is now 30. Uh, I know I, we had him when I was seven. So he's 30 now. And uh, the one in the middle is my 15 year old. That's him on the right as well. Uh, and the one uh, in the right there you know, with the glasses on, that's Bryce. Bryce is now uh, a sophomore at University of Oklahoma. So he's a great example of what we just talked about, saying yes to the opportunity. Bryce is a film major. He wanted to go to the University of Texas in their film department because they have a, a very recognized film department. So he applied. They accepted him, and they said, so there, there's one catch your freshman year, you're going to have to go to one of our other campuses. We have, they got six or seven other um, campuses, University of North Texas, uh, University of Texas Arlington, 
uh, blah, blah, blah. You're going to have to go to one of those other campuses for your freshman year, and then you can come down to Austin. He said, okay, fine. So he goes to UT Arlington, makes straight A's, and, and he's so excited, been in touch with his counselor all through the year. And we start getting into about July, and he's now talking to his counselor, and man, I want to get my, make sure I've got my classes lined up. Everything's going right. Everything's just right. And the counselor said to him, uh, well, you know, you, we can't put you in the film department. He's like, what? We can't put you in the film department. You have to be on campus your freshman year to be in the film department. Well, he told dad that, and dad was ready to, to separate heads from bodies uh, because he was misled. Uh, and so I said, what do you want to do? And he said, well, my second choice was Oklahoma, but the way that the University of Texas has acted, I don't want to go there. I said, okay. So about 72 hours later, he has a full acceptance at University of Oklahoma plus a scholarship, and uh, he is absolutely loving it. But we had that conversation about, look, you had a path, and the first pothole that you hit on the path was, hey, you can't come here your freshman year. You got to go to one of the other campuses. You still had a process to be able to get where you wanted to go. Through the course of doing that, things changed. That happens in life all the time. As if you'll just step back and not be freaked out and stay focused, you might be surprised. He did that, which I'm so proud of him for uh, actually being mature enough to be able to do that. Uh, he stepped back and did that, and he just absolutely is eating Oklahoma up. Uh, just loving it, loving it, loving it. Straight A's still, and so I'm so proud of him. But I'm just as proud of the process that he went through because I, I said, if you'll remember this, this will serve you all through life and serve you very well because life never goes exactly the way that we think it's going to go. Our job never goes that way. I'm in real estate. Every property that I buy never goes exactly the way you think it's going to go. Anytime uh, that you're going out calling on clients, you get a new client signed up, something's going to be a little different, get a little wanky somewhere along the way. And it's how we react to those things. And if we react to it in the right way, then we come out with a better, stronger relationship with the client and they're like, we're doing business with the right people. And that's what you want your clients always thinking about you. So uh, these guys here um, are my pride and joy. So again, we'll be sending you a copy of the book out tonight, uh, PDF on everybody that uh, hangs around with us till the end. And so here's some things that spin off from saying yes to the opportunity. This is me doing a, a book signing. We did 750 books there. Uh, I'm shocked to know you can sign 750 books, uh, personalized with a little uh, statement in it and a signature. You can do that in about two hours. Uh, <laughs> so um, fun stuff, but it happens because you say yes to the opportunity. You know, uh, one of the other things that I love, uh, quotes that I use from Tony all the time, is we get celebrated in public for the things that we do in private. So when the, the publisher came along and said, let's do this thing, the thing I had to do is, is step back and go, okay, well, how am I gonna do this? When am I gonna have time to do this? I've always been an early riser. At the time I was getting up at five o'clock in the morning and I had my basic routine. So I backed my time up and I started getting up at 3.30 and 3.30 to five was my book time. So it'd take me about 15, 20 minutes to get good in the way, get some coffee in me and, and get to going on the keyboard. But that was the time that I used to be able to write the book. Everybody else was still asleep. And were there a lot of mornings that I wished I was still in bed? Sure, there were. But the things that happened in private led to some celebration in public. So if you think about all the time you're putting in with your clients, when you're prepping for a presentation for them, when you're putting together bids, when you're structuring everything that uh, Go Mobile can do for their business specifically, then those are the things that you're doing in private that end up getting celebrated in public. And whether it's that particular sales call or not, or somewhere else down the road, it all comes out because of the time and the effort that you're putting in to service your clients. One of the other things that came out, uh, I spent seven years on the radio because of the book. I was nationally syndicated. 
down was for half that time. So I was on KBC uh, in Los Angeles, um, JSFO in San Francisco. I was on Memphis and Orlando and, and Dallas and Houston, a bunch of other markets. And that was the same kind of thing. Radio station, uh, WBAP here in Dallas, I spent three and a half years on BAP. They are one of the top five talk radio all right, stations. All right, all right. Give what? it to me right now. Give it to yes. me. Give me that WBAP. Kelly. Give me that radio calling. <laughs> Go ahead. But you're listening to WBAP 1080 on your radio dial right here. Real Estate Now with Bill Barnett. Sunday mornings, 8 o'clock. Join us. That was <laughs> it. Go ahead. <laughs> I had to hear that. So uh, that was, you know, this was a remote we were doing, um, which was a, a blast. I was doing an event that weekend and we did the show live and they were like, well, how are we going to do the show? I'm like, uh, have the station come down. We'll just, we'll do it before we go on the air or before we start the event that day. And so we did the radio show. It was an hour long show. We did it uh, out in the lobby of this hotel uh, and we did a lot of call-ins and stuff, fun, fun stuff. I do the podcast now, uh, Investor Guys Podcast. Uh, if you have any interest in real estate, you can jump over to InvestorGuysPodcast.com. I do that with a uh, former student of mine, uh, and we've done about 135, 140 episodes, and, and that do it twice a week. But um, fun stuff, all of this allows you to build your business. Everything that you can do that gives you a platform so that your audience gets to know you a little bit better has an opportunity to be able to increase your business. I got a boatload of business that came out of during the radio show. When I did the book, uh, Robert Allen told me one time, he was like, hey, Bill, you have to understand there's only a few people that make money writing a book. But there's an absolute 100% guaranteed way you can make money because of your book. Now, I was very fortunate, sold a little over 300,000 copies of the book. And so I made a little bit of cash with it. But the money I made because of the book was significant. And why, why it was significant was because it allowed my audience to develop more of a relationship and us to get to know each other better. So anything that you can do, uh, if you're not doing a podcast, you might think about how in the world do, do I fit a podcast? Maybe it's a blog. Maybe it's something just being able to publish once a week uh, about Go Mobile, how it fits, the different industries it fits, why it fits, what you can do with it, just so that you're getting out there and your client base gets a better opportunity to get to know you, not just your services, but they get to know who you are. And the more they hear you, they develop relationship with you. And it's it's really weird. Uh, I was speaking in Tulsa oh, several years ago, um, and I'm standing in line to check in at the hotel. And I'm, I'm talking to uh, travel with several staff people. I'm talking to the staff, and this woman behind me goes, well, that must be Bill Barnett. And I'm like shocked. I turned around, and she goes, I'd recognize that voice anywhere because she had been listening to me for years on the radio. And so you never know when stuff like that's going to happen, but it happens because you're trying to develop relationship with your, I, I call it audience all the time. Everybody that you call on is part of your audience. And if you'll think about that in, in that environment, they're part of my family, they're part of my audience. And I want to get out there and be remindful to them of here's who we are. Here's how this fits for you. Here's what we can do for you. If I can ever be of any service to you, just let me know. And if you do that, you're going to find out there's going to be opportunities that come up that just like Damien did with the call to me, that they go, oh, wait a minute. There's Bill. Let me call him. Hey, there's Damien. Let me call him and see. And that'll happen. And I can just, I want to stress to you as much as I possibly can, think about is there a way for you to be able to publish, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a blog, whether it's a video blog, whether, you know, whatever it happens to whether be. Whether it's a weekly post on Facebook. Just there, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just so that you're getting out there. Uh, you know, we, we do a little thing, Damon, we've been doing it for about eight months now, I guess. Uh, this uh, It's called Just One Thing. 
And it's a motivational quote. We'll do it five days a week on Facebook, not selling anything, not trying to sell anything. It's just to develop relationship. I'm, uh, I love motivational stuff. I've been eat up with it most of my life. And so I have a great collection of, of motivational books and sayings and quotes. And, and so if you remember the, the movie City Slickers, um, back in the 80s with Billy Crystal and Jack Palance, they have this conversation out on the trail and Billy's trying to figure out what the meaning of life is and, and Jack Palance stops and says, it's just this one thing. And if you figure this one thing out, everything else don't mean shit. And he's like, what is it? And he goes, that's what you have to figure out. And I was like, man, the first time I heard it hung with me and then uh, Months ago, I was like, holy cow, I want to use that. So uh, I put out the just one thing, uh, Monday through Friday, and it's just a motivational quote. It is just something that uh, means something to me. Uh, there's no story behind it. There's no explanation of it. It's 15 to 30 words. And I put it on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. But it helps build relationship. And every one of you can do that. Every one of you could, uh, as David said, do a Facebook live post or just a Facebook post where you say, hey, I just saw how a client was interacting with our service this way. And could you plug a client? Sure. Would they love that? You bet they would. Yeah. But you could do that. And it gives other people ideas of, hey, maybe, you know, maybe that's something that I could be doing. So uh, just I want to stress as much as I can, say yes to the opportunity and look for ways to be in front of your audience, your clientele, look for ways to be in front of them from a publishing standpoint. And the Facebook Live is, is certainly an, an easy thing to do there. When you say yes, you're gonna have some opportunities. This, has got, this is a business deal here. Uh, a gentleman of mine, uh, a friend of mine that I had known for just a couple of years, he was uh, um, an attorney, a sports attorney in Dallas, and was went to West Point. He was a helicopter pilot when we uh, invaded uh, Grenada, whenever that was. And he got tapped by uh, some a couple of millionaires out of Phoenix to start an indie racing car team. And so he called me and he's like, "Man, this is so cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna take this. I'm gonna do it." And I was so proud of it. I was like, that's, "That's so awesome! If you ever need anything, you know, let me know. But I'd love to be a part of a race team." He goes, what can you do? And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, you don't want me anywhere near a race car with a tool in my hand. I, that's, that's not it. And he said, well, okay, fine. And I said, but if you think of something, you know, holler, I'm around. So they go do their first race. They got 10 seconds of air time because they wrecked. Toward the end of the race, they wrecked. And this car right here uh, was up on the back of a wrecker. They picked the whole car up in IndyCar. And that was all of the airtime they got. Their sponsors were not happy at all. So he called me about a week after the race in, in IndyCar, especially at the beginning of the season. A lot of times they have two, three weeks between races. Called and he said, you know anything about PR? I'm like, oh, brother, I was doing PR coming out of the womb. Had I ever done PR? No, not technically. Had I done PR all the time? Absolutely. You do too. Every single day that you're talking to your clients, you're doing PR. And so I said, you bet I can do that. And so they hired me for PR. Now, here's the catch. I said, look, I can do it, but you can't afford me. He's like, oh, man. And I said, no, I didn't say you couldn't have me. I said, you can't afford me. The only way that I'll come in and do the PR for the team and do it at the price you want me to do it for is if you make me a member of the pit crew. This guy. And he's like, so uh, what can you do? I said, well, we've already covered that. So uh, he said, well, let me talk to the owners. He came back a couple of days later. He said, all right, got it figured out. Every single race team has a guy, NASCAR, IndyCar, F1, whoever. They all have what's called the sign guy. And it's the guy that tells the car where to stop when they come into the pits. That doesn't take a whole lot of technical skill to hold the sign out. And he's like, you can do that. I'm like, you dead gum straight, I can. So I started doing the sign guy. Within a couple of races, I was pulling hoses for the, the both the front tire changers. And, and I was the guy in charge of replacing the nose on it if we got into an accident. Uh, and then the second year, I was ahead of the fuel team controlling the amount of fuel that I went in the car, which was a, a pretty uh, 
important and fun thing to do. So I spent two years doing that while I was doing my real estate because I had the time available. But, you know, it's just that thing of when an opportunity comes up and I made some incredible relationships doing that. Uh, and then uh, Robert Allen came along right after that. And, and uh, uh, my agent waved the contract in front of me and I was like, holy cow, I'm, uh, I can't say no to that. So uh, I ended up uh, having to retire after two full seasons of my racing career. Uh, but so much fun. And here's the thing. When you look at racing, money equals speed. That's the lesson. Money equals speed. Everybody that you're doing business with is trying to figure out how to get their results for themselves and for their clients faster. I may not be able to get my service any cheaper than it already is. And I don't know about you. I don't, I don't want to be the bottom guy on the barrel. People come to me all the time and, and um, say, wow, you're expensive. And I go, yeah, and not only am I expensive, but I'm worth it because I'm the Bentley of the industry. If you want to buy General Motors, that's fine. That's not me. There's a thousand companies out there. You see them on TV almost every weekend. They'll take whatever money you've got, but that's General Motors. I'm the Bentley. So when you want to go top shelf, I'm the guy you call. I don't want to be the low cost provider, but do I want to be able to provide speed and be faster than my competitor? Yes. Whatever it is that we're trying to deliver, if we can figure out a way to speed that process up, then we end up making more money because of that. And, and that's, that's the lesson like, that came out of IndyCar racing. And to bring that home, it's we'll get you live in the app stores within 30 days. To bring that home, it's we're going to get new customers coming in that front door. To bring it home is we're going to keep those customers coming back more often with the services that we're going to offer. To bring it home again, we're going to show you how you can take advantage of all those new customers you're getting from the third party apps like club up and how that next purchase is going to happen directly with you. Right. It's, it's, that's how to apply it right there. So those kind of things build that relationship. And again, if you stay focused on the relationship, you look at all these other things and you start to understand how I can impact this company, how I can impact that next client of mine, and every client that you sign up means that you have better opportunities for the next client that comes along because that experience broadens what you can deliver to the client base. So money equals speed. And that's the, the whole thing that came out of my time with IndyCar and how it uh, applies to business, how it applies to my business. Uh, one of the things that we do is we have a guaranteed timeline for income. And nobody in the real estate world guarantees income and nobody puts a timeline on it. Well, we do that because over the years, we developed a process to be able to. So when you can do that, then you can go back to a client and say, hey, you know, we have a guarantee. So you may have uh, a performance guarantee from the product. You may have a performance guarantee from the service. You may have a performance guarantee in my case, it's a money uh, guarantee. So you're going to be able to figure out what is it that I can, and you know, I don't want to um, put words in Damien's mouth. You have to, to check with the boss on that. But I'm sure there's some guarantees that you guys can provide for your customer base, uh, even if it's just that, hey, we're going to give you the best customer service out there, and we're going to show you here's how we do that and give them some examples from other companies so that other clients you've been working out so that they can know, hey, you know what? Let's give these guys a shot. So figure out how speed applies to you. How can I provide higher quality? Is there a possibility that there's any guarantees? If there are, how do I deliver those to my client base? And how do they get the results faster? Uh, some of that may just be you. That's how they get the results faster. Some of it may be the, the service in the company, but now, if you figure out that, that puts you a step ahead because in our world now, right now, everything is all about speed. Uh, and so it's been that way for a while. And, and in the information age, it is absolutely the number one thing and how we can go about delivering our results faster. 
All right, so the riches are in the niches. You've all heard this before. You've been around sales training in your life. You've heard the riches are in the niches. And uh, in my business, I, I got niche slapped uh, about two years ago. And so what being niche slapped is was, and it was one of the, the best things that's happened to me. You know, many times in life, we have something that happens and we were like, oh man, this is the worst thing in the world. And then you look back and, oh wow, it was the best thing that could have happened. Um, we may or may not get into this depending on uh, our timeline tonight, but I'm probably the only guy, I'm going to step out pretty strong here. I'm probably the only guy that you've ever met or heard of that's been divorced twice in the same month. So uh, there, there may be a story to that later on. <laughs> and so the riches are in the niches. you got to figure out where we niche down to. And so if I do that, then I find out who I select as my customer base. See, one of the things that uh, happens with us so many times in business is we think everybody's our customer. Well, if you think everybody's your customer, you have a shitty business. That's just life. You can't do that. You've got to focus in on who is it that is my client base. And when I got niche slapped, I got niche slapped by the business when we got locked down. Because for years, I've been the real estate answer to everybody for everything. And my business suffered because of that. Then we had COVID hit, the lockdown hit, and suddenly a business that was built on face-to-face -face consulting, was built on live events, was built on me being out in the marketplace, meeting with agents, meeting with investors, buying and selling, came to a screeching halt. And it didn't come to a halt a little bit, it got shut down. And even though I live in Texas and, and we've been pretty much open the whole time, that doesn't mean that people weren't scared out of their gourd here because they were. And it was weird. Uh, you remember these times you get out. Um, I found a, uh, in the definition that came from the federal government as to what was considered um, those necessary services. I went through that. It was about an 18 page document. And I found a paragraph that fit for real estate investors perfectly. But guess what? There wasn't anybody else out there. And so it was tough. And then I looked at a segment of my business that wasn't affected. And it was a small segment. It had uh, gotten larger and smaller and wavered through the years. I've been in and out of it. And it was the guaranteed income segment, the Section 8 segment. And turned on a dime when I realized, you know what? This segment of the business not only is not being affected at all, it's actually exploded. And it's continued to do that. And, and I refer to that as getting niche slapped. And it was one of the best things that's happened to my business. So when we start drilling down, and that's the, the thing, again, I, I hope the thing that you'll get out of tonight is that I need to figure out who it is that I serve. And I don't want it to be this big, massive, uh, you can't serve everybody. You know, anytime I'm talking to uh, clients, and I do business consulting as well, uh, and so I ask you, who is your client base? Who do you serve? They say, well, what we do fits for everybody. I'm like, so your business sucks. That's what you're telling me. Well, what, what, what? And I'm like, if it fits for everybody, then you're not doing much business because you can't fit for everybody. Uh, air and water, that's about it. Those are about the only two things and, you know, not much profit there. So what I would look at is how can I focus more and more and more and drill down deeper and deeper to find out who is it that can that I resonate with as working with them from a client standpoint that I can deliver the best services for them and be the best in that segment of the marketplace and not worry about the whole market, worry about a sliver that you can just go in and be the king of and you'll end up making more money doing that. Now, um, I'll let you guys figure out how that how that works, Damien. But, you know, you can make more money the more narrow your niche gets. And so you find out, I call it who you select. So we started this thing off saying that you've been selected. You've been selected to serve and you have been. But now you also have to figure out who is it that I want to serve and who is it I'm going to serve because you're going to be asked to do a lot. Well, give so me, uh, you, you better like them. I'll give you a little bit of an example here. 
in that, you know, one of uh, the, the community's favorites, her name is Caden Fletcher, and she's drilled down for nine plus years now in the pet hotel niche. Um, as a dog owner, I get what a pet hotel is. I, before being a dog owner, before my wife, I didn't really understand that there's places that you can put your dogs up for two to $3,000 a week while you go on vacation. So anyway, she nailed it. And as she drilled down deeper, she gets to know the customer. She gets to know the language. She gets to know the pain point. She gets to know the problems. She gets to know exactly how it is that our product and service can serve that audience, not only the business, but also the business's customers. And a real true understanding of that really only comes from working within the niche, drilling down deep in the niche. Today, I was on the phone with someone that we thankfully we've reconnected again. It's been a couple of years. Um, in fact, there's a few people on this webinar and you might also find that you're one, th this, this describes you. You hadn't heard from Damien in two years, right? Well, it turned out, Bill, this, this, this will give you the GBs. Over 20,000 people on our list have kind of just been sat over here from former management and uh, that, that, that were trained by somebody out there on how to clean our email list. And as it turns out, people just thought I disappeared for a couple of years. And lo and behold, now my uh, director of marketing, we're, we're mailing it again and people are coming back in. I see some folks that are on here now that I hadn't seen in a long time. I was on with her today. Her name is Nikki Dealey. And you know, she saw the whole thing about the cannabis. She's out there in uh, Texas, out there with you. She owns a very successful agency. And as it turns out, she's been doing mobile applications. And you know what? I said, man, this cannabis industry is really hot. Are you going to go after it? She goes, no, no, I'm not. She goes, I can see why it's hot. And I know they got the budgets and they got the money, but I'm called to serve the restaurants right now because I, I, I watched what happened to them during COVID. So it speaks to my heart. That's who I, that's where I want to spend all of our time. So you could want to spend time within a niche based on expertise, based on a niche that you just enjoy or an altruistic, like, in her position, she just wants to take care of that niche. You know, even though there are other niches that might even be more lucrative, might yep. even might even net her more profits, but she's gonna find somewhere she's gonna thrive because she's gonna be happy. So there's something to be said, Bill, about picking a niche that you'll also be happy in serving. Yeah, and you can't serve at the level that the market demands you serve at to be successful if you don't like the niche. If you don't like the people that you're dealing with, you got you got to love them. And uh, in the marketplace that, that for my business, it breaks my heart to see families that don't have a home. And so years ago, the federal government set up a Section 8 program, and that's to help underprivileged families have a place to live. There's so much dignity that is involved, in my opinion, with our families when we have a home, whether it's an apartment or a condo or a single family house or a trailer out in the woods or whatever, if you've got a place that's home, especially when you got kids involved, it changes the dynamic for that family. And so it just, it, it really just it breaks my heart. I don't know another way to say it. Uh, when I find out about families that don't have a home. So I got involved with the section eight program uh, on a full-time basis, not just now, I've been in and out of it for almost the whole time I've been in real estate, but I said, you know what, uh, I'm stopping everything else. This is where the full focus of our business is going to be. And when you do that, things change in your personal life, it changes in your business life. And so the amount of fulfillment, uh, first of all, that's, that's a bonus, the fulfillment that's come out of helping these families get into property because there's not a single market in our entire country that has an appropriate amount of Section 8 housing. And Damien, I'll just, I'll throw some numbers out here. Uh, for Texas, for every 100 families that have qualified for Section 8, there are 30 houses that have qualified. So you got 100 families fighting over 30 houses. And there's a lot of uh, California and Florida, the, the numbers are the same. So this, this is all over the country. There's this massive shortage for these houses. And so when we started focusing on that, the bonus that you get is being able to see these families go into those properties. And uh, be, I, I worked with a lady that uh, single mom, she had a 13 year old son and we got her squared away in her house. And 
and I don't meet most of them, but I, I, I do go meet some of them. And, and Yolanda was somebody I wanted to, to go by and say hello to. And uh, we got her squared away in our house and move in day. And, and so she was very excited to uh, say hello. And we're just, we're talking and she literally just breaks down and starts crying. And I'm like, are you okay? Is you uh, everything okay with the house? What's going on? And she said, first time, first time my son is going to be able to have a dog. And I'm a dog guy. So then I'm crying. She's crying. You know? And you don't get that kind of stuff if you can't open up and care about the people that you do business with. And so you get, you and I, as the business end of it, we get way more out of that stuff than our clients do. Uh, but we have to know that we have to care about them and be there for them and drill down. And that niche will help you do that. So the niche within the niche within the niche, and that's what we're gonna talk about. So you gotta know that uh, who you select, you gotta know who they are, and you got to know that on a, a deep level. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. We all know demographics, the analysis of the population of, according to age, race, sex, socioeconomic factors, demographics. Now in radio, we were, everything was about the demographic. But for you and I as salespeople, demographics are important, but psychographics are infinitely more important in my opinion. So the psychographics, it's really about who we're doing business with. It's the study of their personalities, their values, their opinions, the attitudes, what they're interested in, their lifestyle. It's about who they are as a person. So demographic is kind of their stat sheet, but psychographics is the emotional side of who they are. And people do business first and foremost, about half of all sales made are made emotionally. Uh, so you have emotion, you have logic, and you have fear, fear of missing out typically. So you got about 50% of all sales that are made emotionally. And then you got about 30% that are made with logic and about 20% that are made out of fear. So the biggest piece of everything that you and I do in the marketplace is based on the emotion of our client base and what they're going through. Because for us, it may be a business decision. But when you look at all of these different business people and the businesses that they have, this is their life. This is a very different thing for them. I, I grew up in the shoe business. My dad had a, a small chain of shoe stores in, in Alabama. And, you know, it, it wasn't just, oh, somebody was coming to buy a pair of shoes. This was our life. This is how we had our food. This is how we had our homes. This is how we had our cars. So it was a very different thing. And it took me a long time. And I was well away from my dad's business before I started understanding that stuff. But that's what psychographics is. It, it takes the emotion of who we're calling on and it takes that into consideration. And I'm going to tell you, that's infinitely more important, in my opinion, than the demographic information. The demographic is just statistics. It might tell us they can afford our product, but the psychographics will get us into their head and we can understand what's going on. I mentioned earlier that conversation that's already happening in their head. Psychographics is how we get there and how we understand what they're looking for. And so when you start thinking about what, what's important to them, and I'm not talking, we all been taught, oh, you know, ask about their kids and uh, their dog. I get that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about deeper level stuff. When you start talking to people and you, you start to understand, you understand their religion without getting involved in their religion. You understand their politics without getting involved in their politics. You understand their concerns about what's going on with the economy. You and I are going to have a crucial role going forward because our economy is falling apart. Uh, it, th there's nothing going to happen to stop it because that's what the government wants to have happen. And whether you agree with that or not, so that's okay. Yeah, but it's going to fall apart. Uh, right now, uh, Jimmy Carter is you know, dancing a jig because he's like, oh, my gosh, there's somebody that has a worse economic policy than I did. So uh, it's going to happen. And our clients are going to need us to help them weather the storm. The real estate market is going to turn down. Now, it was going to turn down anyway because we're way overdue in the real estate market. And, and I look at all underlying factors and we've been having the underlying factors change for about the last 14 to 16 months. 
and they'll change uh, for at least another year before we start publicly seeing the cumulative effect of all that stuff. But when you know these things are coming, whether it's real estate or how a uh, new regulation might affect y'all's business, and you have an opportunity to, to kind of uh, emotionally uh, put your arms around your client and help them through this process so that uh, they know that you're part of the team. And when they accept you as part of their team, you got a client for life. And that's the key to this thing is I want people to know that, that I'm a part of their team. I want you guys want them to know that Go Mobile is a part of not just the business, but you as the representative are part of their team. And that psychographics will. This whole thing you just talked about is exactly how these happy hours came about. Exactly Excellent. right. It's exactly right. You know, I, I tell the story. Um, you know, we had, uh, it was me and Anthony Morrison. Um, you know, we were promoting his really cool mobile product and he was promoting our mobile app product. And this was, we, you know, back to back, we both sold zero with over, you know, between the two webinars, maybe 350, 400 people. And the pandemic had just hit. And, and the reason I say this story is because that was an anomaly that had never, ever happened. Mm -hmm. not, for, not for, you know, decades, right? Have, have we goose egged like that? But it was because everyone was scared. And the executive team, we got together and we said, well, what are we going to do? Sell more? No, we're going to lean in and we're going to love on everyone and we're going to get to know everyone and we're going to create a forum where they get to know each other and they have somewhere to go on Friday night. And man, some of these things went till midnight. You won't be going to midnight tonight. I promise you. Don't you worry. But I mean, really, that's how this started is, is everything that you just talked about right now. And so uh, anyway, thought I would point that out for those that have been on here for the last year and a half They're They're probably realizing. And so 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 what can you do? with your customers and your prospects and those that you serve um, in this, in this vein, what can you do to really show up for them? Yep. So that's so crucial. You know, whether it's um, we're doing some things right now with our client base. And so in my business, there are, there are two customers. There's the big customer, which is uncle Sam, but to service the families, I got to go through uncle Sam. So my client's on the other side of the guy that writes the check. So I got to keep the guy that writes the check happy to be able to service the client base. And so what we're doing uh, with the client base is we're, we're putting together and, and it's very um, rough stages right now, but we're putting together some basic financial education, not trying to get them into to real estate, just trying to share with them some things that especially for those families that have kids because financial education in our school system is horrendous it doesn't exist uh, in most school systems um, and just basic stuff uh, and so we're, we're um, putting together i'm working with hansen margaret johansson uh, to put together some things so that we can help deliver uh, some basic financial education to these families that are in these tough socioeconomic areas that are all, uh, they're all low income families. I mean, that's how they get involved in the Section 8 program. Uh, and so many of them uh, are looking for a way out. They appreciate the Section 8 program, but they're looking for a way out. And so if we can just help them understand that there is opportunity out there and how they may be able to get involved in some of it, then if you can change one family's direction and one family's life, it's that's you know just worth all of it. So uh, that's what we're trying to do to deepen that relationship uh, with them so that they understand that, hey, uh, this is more than us just providing you a house and collecting rent. This is us being in this with you. So all that, again, comes out of psychographics and what they're trying to do, because what you and I have to learn, what all of us have to understand, the single most important thing that we can deliver is value. Nothing tops value. Now, I, I am uh, in today's real estate world, I'm ridiculously expensive. Uh, and when people come in and do consulting, but 
people say, well, how do you keep selling when everybody else, and I, I've had marketing company after marketing company say, you, you can't do that. And I'm like, okay, well, in your mind, I can't do it. We'll just go ahead and continue to do it because the customer doesn't care about price. That's what most people lose and, and miss. The customer cares about value. If you're delivering the value, price goes out the window. You, all you have to do is look at the automotive world. Uh, there's value being delivered uh, at a certain level, a Mercedes or a Cadillac or a Lincoln or a Bentley or a Roll, whatever it happens to be at a certain level, there's different types of value being delivered. So that's status value, but there's value being delivered that makes the client want to go out and spend that extra money. And then they're glad they spent the money. And one of the things that you'll learn as clients spend more money with you is the more they pay, the more they pay attention. And so they start to understand that you can deliver massive value. Uh, we do stuff that's crazy. Uh, you're probably uh, getting a chance to hear my, I have a 130 pound uh, female German shepherd that's in heat right now. She's about 10 feet behind me. <laughs> so she may get a little loud. Uh, uh, she weighs more than most of the women I've dated in my life, but uh, going right along, uh, if we understand how to deliver value to the client base, that relationship becomes stronger and we can charge whatever we want to charge. Because if, if you keep in mind that value always will override pricing, they'll figure out a way to pay more money if they see the value there. If they don't see the value, it doesn't matter what your price is. They're not going to become a client. Okay, so we're looking at that, that fact all the time. Nothing tops value. How do we increase value more and more and more? Then, uh, so I, we always look at a couple times a month, we sit down and we go through how do we make this better? And we do that with them. I do that with people that are paying for my consulting. I have uh, every two weeks, we either do a Zoom call or we'll meet somewhere for lunch or dinner and it'll be, hey, how do we make this thing better for you? I'm open to whatever suggestions are. Doesn't mean I'm gonna do that, but I wanna know what you're thinking and how we can make it better. I wanna know what, how we're doing. And it's always nice to keep that up to date on how we're doing for you. Because if you're always up to date on how we're doing, nothing festers. And so when something goes wrong, and look, stuff goes wrong for all of us on a regular basis, that's life. But if we're staying on top of being in contact with them, and I, right before uh, we got on, I, I wrote this down because I went through this today with one of uh, the people that I'm uh, being mentored by. She said something and it just, I was like, oh my gosh, that is just so perfect, so straight on. And it says, ask, listen, and execute. I said, well, that's what we do when we do our every two weeks meeting with our, our clients. We ask them, what can we do to be better of more value, better service for you? We listen to what they're saying and then we execute on it. I've never done uh, up until a month ago, I had never done financing on our packages. None. It's always been, hey, if they can't afford it, they can't afford it. That's OK. Um, I'm not cut out for everybody. And we had so many people that kept coming back and saying, I'd like to do what you're doing with you, but is there any way you can set up a financing program? And I was like, nah, 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 nah. Well, then three calls in a row, literally in a row on the same day, there was a can't do it if there's not some kind of financing package. And then that popped up and I said, you know what? Uh, I sat down and in the course of about 20 minutes, put together a financing package. Uh, and it's helped us close more deals already, and it's less than a month old. Okay, so ask, listen to the answer, and then execute. You may not be able to do everything that they want done. Some of it's going to be wild and crazy. I get that. But they're going to appreciate the fact that you're asking. They're going to appreciate the fact that you're listening. Look, if you're married or you've ever been married, you know that second part, listen, is the single most important thing that ever happens. That's what keeps mama happy somewhere down the road. It took me a long time to learn that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, it didn't affect the last one because I didn't learn it soon enough. But 
that's what women all say they want. They want to be heard. They want to be listened to. They want to share their emotions. They want to go through the psychographics with you. Uh, so, do so, clients, so do prospects. And so does that other person on the other side of the table. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I'd suggest you write that down. Ask, listen, execute. Uh, that's a home run. And so. Bill, can I tell you how glad I am to hear that it's not someone that you have chained up back there? I, I <laughs> oh, oh, maybe she'll be quiet. Uh, her name is Vixen. She's a blonde, too. As, as you know, I like blondes. So, now, is this, uh, this is your boy. He played baseball. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, here's what I was going to say. Um, this is a value example. So my kid's uh, a power hitting first baseman. So a lot of different lessons that evolve around uh, baseball and the things that he's gone through. I, I've coached him most of his life and blah, blah, blah. So power hitting first baseman. And I, for a season, have been having this conversation with him is to be able to continue to move forward, you want to play district ball. You want to be able to um, be involved in, in travel teams. You're, you're he, In the eighth grade, he started talking about uh, he wanted to be able to uh, go to college on a baseball start. I'm like, okay, fine. You have to understand that you have to figure out how do you deliver more value to the team. And I, for a season, that was my message to it. And it was like, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? I'm like, well, uh, you, as one of your coaches, I'm telling you, one of the things you can do is you can learn to pitch. He said, well, Dad, I'm not a pitcher. I'm like, you're not a pitcher because you've never tried pitching. And then this is him. Uh, he became the stud pitcher uh, in our district, going through the lessons of understanding how to be more value. And when he's playing high school, uh, he was first base and, and pitching. Um, and so just, you know, tickle his first season that I wasn't coaching him. So I'm, I'm uh, in the stands going nuts and, and – uh, so they lose the first two games because they had poor play in center field. Very frustrated. And he was. And he's like, you know, uh, oh, man, you know, we got to fix that, you know. And I'm like, dude, go to your coach and tell him you will play center field. I said, he can take well, – there was a guy on the bench. I said, there's a guy on the bench that is a serviceable first baseman but you can be a stellar center fielder. Nobody on the team runs like you do. You play first base. You don't run anywhere. You know, when you're hitting, fine. But in the field, you run very, very little, and yet you're the fastest guy on the team. And so in the middle of a game, he goes in the dugout and tells the coach, when we go back out, I'm going to center field. I'm tired of us losing because these guys can't catch the ball out there. I can catch the ball. And so he goes to center field and becomes a center fielder for the rest of the season, all district, blah, blah, blah. But it was getting that through the noggin, how do I be more valuable to my team, whether it's my sports team, whether it's my business team, whether it's my family, what can I do to be more valuable? And if we keep that in our minds, how do I deliver more value? Because that's going to make me more valuable as a member to, as a member of, the Go Mobile family uh, working for Go Mobile, that's going to make you more valuable to Go Mobile. It's going to make you more valuable to the clients. And wherever there's more value, one of the, the great things I learned from my dad through the years, I was pitching one time about how uh, I was the top salesperson in the company, about 60 salespeople. And I felt like I should be uh, getting a better territory or made management. I just wasn't happy with what was going on. And he said, don't worry about it. If they don't give you a raise, somebody else will. Because everybody in your industry is seeing what you're doing. And it made me stop and slow down a little bit and go, oh, he's right. And then within about four months, the tops in the industry said, hey, we've been watching you. We'd like for you to come to work for us. And I would have never thought about going to work for them had I not received a phone call for them. That's why I was living in LA and it just blew me away. But it's that understanding the value premise. Every day is an evaluation of what I'm delivering to my client. How can I be more valuable to them individually and to them as a group? 
And if I can do that, uh, and we always told when I was coaching, I always told my kids, look, when we go practice, try to try to be 1% better today. Don't want you to be 10% better. Don't want you to be 100%. I want you to try to be 1% better today because we're practicing multiple times a week and it'll show up over time. And the same thing for us as salespeople. When we're out working with the public, if we can just be 1% better today over time, we're going to separate ourselves from everybody else in the industry. So, uh, so he, he became a pitcher and, and uh, that was uh, a hoop for me. Well, but what I, was I want to I wanted to add and make it applicable for everybody here. You know, they watched Katie Fletcher. I know you keep hearing me bring her name up, but you know, she's something that someone that everyone looks up to in the community. And what does she do? She charges one hundred and fifty dollars to two hundred dollars a month on the mobile app because she's doing value add. You know, she's teaching them how to use the push notifications. She's she's teaching them how to use the gift and loyalty and the various things. Again, being narrowed in the niche, she, un she understands where she could provide more value and on a business consulting level. And she's raising her monthly prices now. But you're right, uh, digital marketing agencies, which is pretty much everyone that's on this call, Bill, you know, they make more money by providing more value added services. Bottom line, you make more money per month, more recurring revenue, the more value you can provide. Not a bad exercise to sit down and think about, not only is it the products and services that you sell, where are the other areas of value that you can bring to the table that come from your career, your background, your knowledge, your schooling, or whatever? Um, you know, Elena Enton's on here. So yeah, we're talking about digital marketing, but she's also really good at project management and she's been in the engineer world and project management. So, you know, again, not, not to stray too far off the reservation. The point being is think about the different ways where you have unique value that you can also bring to the table besides the marketing you're selling. Them. And, you know, you'll find that you'll be more profitable and you'll be taking care of more people. Back to you. Because every one of us, have our own story. And you know, I, I find people just incredibly interesting. And I find older people even more interesting because the stuff they've lived through. And so when, when you start to care about the people as an individual, then you start figuring out those things about, hey, you know, here's a way for me to do a value add for them. Uh, and look, I, I'm not bashful about charging. I don't think anybody should work for free. I'm not ever going to do it. I haven't. Don't plan on starting it. But if you deliver the value, the clients are, are just going to be going, hey, uh, not only are they going to be paying you more money, but they'll share with other people they know in the industry, hey, you ought to be using these guys and here's why. So in, in a digital uh, ad agency, if you don't know that client on a deep level, uh, you're not going to be able to provide the best service for them. Uh, it's that way with, with everything. So when I'm looking at the mother load of success in my niche, I want to know who's my market. You know, I got a niche down for that. Then I want to know inside my market, who's my market. So when I think I've got my niche figured out, now I want to step back and go, there's a niche inside my niche. And then when I've got that figured out, I'm going to do it one more time. And so I'm drilling down to where, I've got a very, very tight specific, and the tighter and more specific my niche is, the easier it is for me to find them and to be able to just round them up. They're out there, they wanna be serviced, and everybody likes running with people that are like them, that are in the same industry and, and can build relationship that way. So the deeper in the niche that you get, the better your service is gonna be for them and the more money that you're gonna make in the course of that, and that's the people that I can impact the most. So my niche, my niche inside my niche, then my third level down, my niche inside the niche inside the niche. And if I'm doing that and I'm constantly drilling deeper and getting my niche more refined and more focused, then I'm just going to be able to do a better job for it. Let, so, let, let me bring um, a question to the front that someone asked earlier. Sorry, yeah. um, it's I got to scroll up there. I think it was David. You know, if you're going after the restaurant niche, that is a niche in itself. The sub niche is the sushi restaurant yep. versus the burger shop, right? So, so do you do you, you know for the restaurants? Do you think it's pretty important within what you're teaching tonight 
to even go deeper into the sub niches of the restaurants. Absolutely. I, I uh, had a conversation this past week in, in one of the masterminds that I'm involved with. We had somebody that was that services the restaurant industry, and she was talking about uh, how they exploded over the last uh, year and a half. And she was, hey, we we and they provide some kind of uh, service that does um, food inventory management, and uh, it didn't mean anything to me, but. Um, but she said, you know, here's what happened. We now only work in these two segments of the restaurant industry, which I thought was hilarious, donuts and sushi. I'm like, there's an interesting combo, but donut. And she just kept niching down. But the further down the niche she got, the more business they did because they were able to spend their time focused on if somebody's running a donut shop, they have a very specific set of requirements that's completely different than some guy running a burger shop or, or somebody that's uh, got a, a Mexican restaurant. And so it allowed them to really, and she said, you know, we're, they've gotten to the point, she said, we're really debating, are we going to cut one side of this out? Are we going to drop donuts? Are we going to drop sushi? So we haven't done that yet, but she said, we've seen the impact that we've seen as we've narrowed and narrowed and narrowed, we're looking at, um, do we do that? Do we just go to one of those? But absolutely, uh, when you start refining that, because everybody has, even though they're in the same industry, everybody has a different set of requirements based on, on their menu. Yeah. Are, and do they have barf with their food? You know, are they just purely restaurant? Or do they have a, a bar going on? Do they have patio? All that kind of, you know, Mexican restaurants, you know, it's a whole... Uh, different things. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Absolutely. So uh, I want to uh, wrap up with, uh, with this. This is the, uh, the million dollar bloody nose. So um, Jerry probably knows uh, back in the eighties, I created a television show uh, that ran five days a week, uh, about 55% of the nation for three and a half years. Uh, it was an early morning motivational show, mostly on NBC. It was called Dawn, Dynamic Achievers World Network, and Zig Ziglar did eight uh, episodes on it, Art Linkletter and Paul Harvey and uh, Norman Vincent Peale. And uh, if you remember uh, Remington Shavers and Victor Kayam, the guy that said, uh, I, I love the Razor so much I bought the company. Uh, uh, Vic did a couple of episodes and uh, Norman Brinker, the guy that founded Chili's, blah, 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 blah. We had all these great people on there. Well, I created that show and executive produced that show. And... Here's how that show came into being. Uh, it was a million dollar budget back in 83. And so I didn't have a million dollars. And I was like, how in the world am I going to put this thing together? And I, I met a guy uh, who was a, a fairly young guy. He was about 15 years older than me and had done extremely well. And so uh, he said, come by and uh, because I talked to him about the show. He said, come by and, and I'll have you speak to our, our board of directors. Uh, and we may be interested in, in uh, being involved with you here. So it was about a five-hour presentation. Uh, me and about, uh, there's probably 14 guys in there that, uh, you know, were significant. I was probably 27, 28. And I'm getting, I'm about three quarters of the way through my presentation. And I'm, I'm looking around the, the, the table there and their eyes are getting big. And I'm like, man. I got them, man. They are digging this. They are into this. This is, oh, man, I'm crushing it. And I look down, and there's blood all over the front of my shirt. And my nose is like a faucet. Just, And I looked up, and I went, excuse me, I'll be right back. And the guy went to the bathroom, and I'm, you know, I'm running water, and I got paper towels, and I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. And I get it stopped as quickly as I possibly can. I walk back in, sit down started immediately to say anything about it. I just picked right back up where I left off, finished the presentation. They said, Hey, uh, Barry uh, was the guy that ran the company. Barry goes, Hey, uh, give us a little bit to talk. Just wait outside out there. And I said, okay, fine. So I get outside, I'm waiting in the lobby and I'm like, man, I, this, how embarrassing was this? Oh my gosh. These guys will never uh, do this deal uh, because I had this bloody nose and they, Called me back in and Barry said, we want to do this. 
we're going to be your partner. We're going to put up the million bucks, boom, boom, and, and off we went. And I'm sky high. So I report back with him Monday, and, and uh, he had an office building. He had two floors in. So I was setting up shop there, and, and he and I go to lunch that day. And I'm like, Mary, you got to tell me what part of the presentation was it that made you guys say, yeah, we got to do this? Is it, is it the, the, all the guests that I've already got lined up? Is it how you see I can squeeze production dollars like nobody's business? Went through all these different things, and he goes, no. It's when your nose started bleeding. I'm like, what? He said, we were blown away after you came back in, you finished the presentation. When you went out, we were like, if he can stay as focused on business as he was on this presentation, we got a home run on our hands. And so million dollar bloody nose. So the point of that is focus on what you're trying to achieve because this kind of stuff, we're all going to get a bloody nose in business sooner or later. And it happens all the time. If we stay focused on what we're trying to achieve, we just keep moving forward. That, and that's what I want to wrap with tonight, brother. That is a really good story. Don't know how I missed that story all these years. That is a winner story. All right, lightning round. The best advice you've ever received? Say yes to the opportunity. Okay. I mean, outside of, and I, let me rephrase that. The best advice I've ever seen is I accepted ever Jesus. Received, ever, ever, ever received was ever. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That okay. was the single best thing okay. that ever happened to me in my life. Uh, All right. Knowing your audience here. Step, okay. A book that you would recommend and why? You mean other than, are you done with your books? Other than your books, yeah. <laughs> so, it's pretty funny. Um, you know, I, I still love Think and Grow Rich. I, I think it has so many uh, incredible uh, pieces to it. My favorite book right now, and, it, and it's been my favorite for about the last two years, I'm on my third or fourth time through it, is The Power of Focus. Uh, Mark Victor Hansen, Jack Canfield, Power of Focus. I love it. Um, and I, I think that's what um, has been a detraction for so many people in their business is they just can't stay focused long enough to get out of their own way and prioritizing um, the difference between am I being busy or am I creating results? And I, for my clients, I have that, we have that conversation regularly. Hey, you know, cause they'll, they'll get hung up on uh, gee, they'll call me and say, Hey, uh, I, what do I need to name my LLC? And I'm like, I don't care. Nobody else cares either. Well, no, it's, it's the public face of what I do. I'm like, no, it's not. You're the public face of what you do. You could name it, I don't give a shit, LLC, and it'll be a year before anybody ever picks up on it. And then they'll have a good laugh out of it. It doesn't matter. Focus on what you're trying to achieve and don't let the minutia get you wrapped up. My, my One of my favorites is I get asked about asset protection all the time um, in our business. And I'm like, look, my suggestion would be get some assets to protect first. Then we'll worry about that. So stay in the results, but power of focus, fabulous book. Well, and I'm just going to go ahead and piggyback off that for a learning moment applicable to everybody here is if you, you know, stay focused on writing that list of that low hanging fruit list of business owners that you know that you might be able to serve. Stay focused on getting that app submitted if you haven't even pushed the button to submit your first app. We don't need to worry about what the website looks like, whether or not we're going to have a business card and all these different things. Stay focused on that immediate objective. The immediate objective is identify those product prospects. The next one is to get something submitted. And the next one is to close that first app sale. Yeah. Right? You know, you use the fact that you're teamed up with us. We've been around. You can do all of that stuff. But again, stay focused on that immediate objective. Uh, the rest will start to fall into place. Yeah. All that other stuff will take care of itself. I do have one thing that uh, I want to throw out here uh, that truly is the last thing I want to say. And this has um, more to do with who you are as a person. Um, I want to challenge everybody that's on with us tonight uh, to do uh, what I refer to as the top 10. And, and uh, most of us are old enough to remember when Letterman was around doing his top 10. But here's the top 10 challenge that I want to give you. We're getting toward, uh, you know, we're almost in fourth quarter here and, and 
you know, we're going to be in, in the holidays in the blink. Well, I guess we are in fourth quarter. Holy cow. Uh, we're going to be in the holidays in the blink of an eye. As we get into the end of the year, I want you to think about the people in your life that have been the most important in your life this year. Uh, not somebody that was uh, important 10 years ago. This year, of course, they got to be living because we're going to, uh, I'm going to ask you to do something for them. But the 10 most impactful people in your life over the past 12 months, and I want you to write them a letter. I don't want you to send them an email. I don't want you to send them a text. I don't want you to call them. I want you to be archaic, and I want you to get a piece of paper out and handwrite them a letter and tell them how much they mean to you and the impact that they've had over your life over this past 12 months. And then I want you to put it in the snail mail and send it to them. And you're going to be amazed at how it makes you feel to express the gratitude of people that are important to you. And you're going to be blown away by how it makes them feel. That is beautiful. And that wraps up the lightning round because the last one was a resource or tool other than your own that you would recommend. And you just did it right now. Cool. Perfect, man. That's beautiful. I love that challenge. Bill, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. I, I, my gut instinct was correct. You know, um, like I had mentioned, you know, there were folks that, uh, that we both mutually know that uh, I've had the opportunity, like getting the opportunity to meet with you. I've had the opportunity to meet so many really great individuals out there, thought leaders. And I got to tell you, meeting you and watching you at work, and now here, two decades later, or, you know, being able to get you to come back on to teach our community. You know, I, I'm remembering the days I watched you on stage. Now I just watched what you did with our community, giving them some great tools like this and increasing their value. And you drove it right home, man. I really appreciate it. You nailed it. I knew you would. <laughs> but, uh, no, it really means a lot. It, it means a lot to me, you know. Um, First of all, that I can pick up the phone and and and, and call, and that you'll pick it up <laughs> anytime. Number, anytime. Number one, number one. I mean, let, let, let's talk about relationships and how we started this thing off. I mean, picking up the phone and one, you'll pick it up. Two, you'd say, well, sure, I'll come and speak and teach your community and give up my Friday night. So, thank you so much, man. I'm so honored. And I well, absolutely. You know, I love you, brother. And and anytime I can do anything, you know how to get a hold of me. I look forward to it. All right, and please tell everybody how they can follow you. We put the post. Jerry Excellent. also put the post in here of your podcast and stuff. But uh, how can they follow you? And, and um, so the the two things: the podcast, InvestorGuysPodcast.com, and then 10K, the number 10K Monthly.net, 10K Monthly.net. So those are the the best two things. The 10K Monthly.net is what I do. And the podcast is uh, is the podcast. So 10kmonthly.net and then uh, investorguyspodcast.com. Awesome, Bill. Well, before we let you go, I want everybody to do what we love to do. We love to sign off our guests so that one day they'll come back. Now, we love to give them just a great big hug and a really good thank you. And uh, let's, let's really show Bill some love on the way out, everybody. Go ahead and unmute. Do it now. Tell them what's up. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Bill. Oh, Bill. Fantastic. Bill. Awesome, Bill. Thank you. Bill. Love you. That rock. Thank you. Awesome. Encore. Love it all. Thank you. Encore. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, thanks, thanks. See you guys. Bye, everybody. All right, Bill. Thank you so much. Have a you great day, brother. Weekend. You Have too, a great night, fellas. Yeah. Nice job, Bill. Thanks. That was Mr. Foster. Hey, thanks, Jer. Jerry. See you, brother. All right, everybody. Well, you know, that was so much fun. And uh, I'm going to, because it's so much fun, I'm going to keep doing it. And I'm going to uh, be bringing you more folks. I've got somebody lined up for next week. Get ready. I won't do any spoiler alerts right now. I want you to focus on what it was that you learned today. Because I'm pretty clear that you came away with at least one or two nuggets that you can directly apply into your agencies, which validates my creative idea of bringing some of my great friends in the real estate investing world who coach, teach, and mentor right here, teach you business strategies, motivational strategies, and just really good, good work. So that was awesome um, um, that, that Bill delivered today. So that was just super awesome. So thank you all of you for your time. You know, I know there's so much more you could be doing on a Friday night, but you decided this Friday night you'd be hanging out with me. So I super appreciate that. 
and uh, go and love your, uh, go and hug your loved ones. Go have a really good weekend. Enjoy your weekend. Like I said, when I started this thing off, I blinked and it was Friday again. I mean, I swear it feels like it was, it was like, it was Friday. Then it was the weekend. Then Bitcoin hit an all time high. And then it was Friday again. And I, I feel like I just went to sleep and woke up. Listen, I love all of you. Go out there, make it happen. We'll see you next week. Go mobile or go home. Go home. Go, home. go mobile or go home. <laughs> go home. Have a great weekend, everybody. Love you guys. All right. Love you, Dan. Go get love that sale, Elena. <laughs> Close them down. Close them down. Thank you. Thank you, Xavier. Hi, Damien. Thanks. Thanks.